Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Afternoon for those of you here in Hawaii, evening or another time for those of you in other places. But thanks so much for being with us. And thanks so much for supporting ThinkTech, which for 21 years has tried to open up dialogues and difficult conversations on things that we need to think about and talk about and speak up and stand up about. And today to do that, we have with us Tina Patterson, very experienced mediator, arbitrator, uh, entrepreneurial coach and consultant from Germantown, Maryland, and Ben Davis in Charlottesville, Virginia, who has taught at a number of law schools as well as practiced in Europe as well as the US, and most recently at Washington Lee School of Law in Virginia. Tina, Ben, seems like, and we'll pass on Johnny Depp and Amber Heard for today. <laughs> but, other than than those two who can fend for themselves the thing still on people's mind is what went wrong and what we keep finding out more about in uvalde texas and, and in this country generally mm -hmm. well good question in everybody's mind what's it going to take well you know if I could jump in, I would start out with, uh, it's actually a comedy routine of a guy named Eddie Izzard. Done, I think it was in 2008 or, no, maybe even earlier than that, you know, where he said that whole line that guns don't kill people, people kill people, okay? And he goes on and says, yeah, but the gun helps. <laughs> you know, look at the, the gun helps. I mean, if you sit there with your fingers and go, I'm going to kill you. Bang, 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 bang. You know, nobody dies. You know what I mean? It's like the gun does help. And so um, I was thinking that the, the way to go would be really, a, I like to call it the market solution from the, the market for death solution, which is basically what are the weapons that are used for the mass shooting? I don't care what the state of mind of the particular person was. I don't, I'm not interested in, you know, a lot of times they kill themselves too. So it says, well, what was the weapon they used? And then, okay, if that's the weapon they used, then we ban that weapon. That's it. You know, and, and I think the single setting, the single shooting, the manslaughter, the murder of one person or something like that, I think we should look at that too. But it's basically saying the market for death is picking these particular weapons. And so we're going to ban them. Now, if you happen to own one, we'll pay you back for it or whatever. You know, we'll give you some money, give you some, give you some uh, 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 coupons to McDonald's. I don't know what, you know, in reverse. But, but you know, uh, that's the theory. Is that, like, the, the market for death has chosen this weapon, and that's the weapon that therefore we will ban. No, another thing is, you know, raising the age. You got to be 21. I think you have to be 21 here in, 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 in Virginia to buy liquor. I can't remember off the top of my head. I get carded a lot, but you know, 66, I'm not really worried, right? You know, but you know, you gotta be 21 to buy a gun. And, and, and then, um, you know, the, then the high powered magazine things, you know, with a hundred bullets in it, you don't need a hundred bullets to kill a deer. Oh man. You can, so sorry, can't have those, you know? And then, some people will say, ah, yeah, but there's Heller and there's a Second Amendment and all that stuff. But if you look at the Heller decision, it does not say you cannot regulate, okay? It does not say that states can't regulate. And that's one of the misnomers that the people who want to push the Second Amendment try to push is that, oh, you know, no, you know, six, the sacred Second Amendment. So that, that would be a first approach. Second approach would be to follow former Justice John Paul Stevens, let's repeal the Second Amendment. <laughs> okay, you know, is it, oh, yeah, that, you know, back in musket times, that was great then, but when we're talking about weapons like this now, there you go, that, that would scare some people. You <laughs> talk about taking away your guns, we'll take away the right that you think you have, you know? Uh, and maybe you could get enough votes for that, but I think that's a little harder to do. But uh, just, you know, it just seems like, uh, you know, a couple of 
options. Now, there's a third option that people are trying to talk about right now, which I find a little weird, so I'm just going to say it. But there are people talking about having those kids in Uvalde, having some of their parents have open casket, just so you can see what an AR-15 can do. And I watched a show uh, on CBS a couple nights ago showing the difference between what a 9 millimeter does and what an AR-15 bullet does. AR-15 bullet destroys a body. I mean, they, they use a kind of gelatin to look like uh, uh, to, that's similar to what soft tissue is, you know, so you can see how the two, and, um, and you know, obviously, the, the first thing that comes to mind is Emmett Till's mom, uh, who decided that Emmett Till would have an open casket, and basically was saying to the world, look, look at what you did to my baby. Now, I just le learned that one of the mothers at uh, Sandy Hook did have uh, the uh, governor see the open casket of his, of of her son uh, Noah uh, to show him just the damage these kinds of guns could do, and you know, so one idea is also to say, okay, all you highfalutin fellow, we're going to fly you on Air Force One to Uvalde, and you can see. Because one of the worries that I thought the mother said that was really true is that if you show them out, you don't know once the, once they're out, you don't know in this internet age what would happen with them, right? In terms of all the craziness that you can imagine. In it. But to have the actual uh, legislative people, the people with the legislative or executive power be, be required to see the kind of damage done to a 10-year-old by these kind of weapons might be something that 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 would uh, that would would work so that's four ideas okay so i don't know what else to say but you know those are i understand why people want to have guns and i understand hunters and all that stuff but you know if you if the the people killing people are using a certain weapon it seems you need to get rid of that weapon um whatever the state of mind of the person who's killing people you know, maybe they can they can use go after each other with pencils. You know what I mean? You know, it's just they can cause a lot less damage. I mean, apparently, even like if, you know, if, if nine millimeters were kept around, people get wounded by nine millimeters. Okay, so but their body gets destroyed by these AR-15. You understand? That's that's what I was listening to somebody who's. Um, um, a trauma surgeon in Philadelphia explaining the difference between what come what these different weapons do, you know, and uh, so you know I just thought, okay, here's here's a simple keep it simple, you know, just we we, we have the kid, the dead kids or the we have the perpetrator or dead or not, what were the weapons they had? Okay, that's on the list. We get rid of those weapons throughout America. So, Tina, what do you think people are really willing to consider? Hey, because we know if 88% of the people are saying, yes, there should be extensive background checks, and 67% in a recent poll said, hey, they should ban assault weapons, not just AR-15s, which are most of the weapons used in the recent mass killings and shootings, especially school shootings but ban assault weapons entirely. And besides those, the red flag laws, those are all alternatives. But uh, what's it going to take when elected officials are still saying, you know, we don't care what those polls are, say, are saying, we can't go against the NRA because we're going to lose our elections at home if we do that. Question. Um, I, I actually think, and Jen, you touched upon this, but I really think the conversation needs to shift um, to regulation and what does regulation look like? Um, and I've said this on this show and I can say it now. I am a firearm owner, but I own one as a matter of self defense. Um, and so I, when I'm talking about regulation, I'm talking about regulation that is consistent 
from one state to another. Whether, you, and right now we've got 50 states with 50 different regulations. I can tell you in Maryland what is required in terms of when you make the purchase, the dealer is registered, the purchaser has to fill out paperwork. The first opportunity to purchase a firearm, there's a 30 day period that you have to wait before you can get that firearm. You do undergo a background check um, and you are fingerprinted. I can't say that for all states and I'm, I'm, I'm being transparent about that. I can't say that for all states because I don't know about all states, but I can tell you that each state is very different about how that firearm is handled. Um, I, then I agree with you. The, the larger discussion is what should be available to the public, knowing that if you suddenly say that assault weapons are not available to the public, there's going to be a black market. And, and how do you address that? Um, you know, yes, there's been a lot of discussion regarding assault weapons being used, but the person who shot those folks in South Carolina used a Glock. And he had multiple rounds and he loaded his magazine several times. So I'm not saying not to, to take the assault weapons out of the public um, reach. I completely agree with that. I don't, I, I don't know if it's, if it's really necessary to have an assault weapon um, as a public user. The, the assault weapons were, were meant for a specific intended audience. And, and unfortunately, it's military. Um, it was not meant for taking out a grudge against another individual in, in your community or whatever. Um, so yes, I, I, I get that. But I think for the legislature, it's really the conversation about what can we do in terms of public safety? And it's the consistent regulation. I have a, a colleague who's been telling me we need federal regulation and he uh, compared it to prohibition. I don't know if that's really the answer because states are going to push back and say, well, yes, you, you've created this federal regulation. Look at um, you know, the Second Amendment. I've got a right to bear arms. I can do this. But if the states are consistent in saying all across, we are going to have red flags. We're going to have 30 days. We're going to have the dealers registered. You, purchaser, are going to have a, a wait period. And I should mention in Maryland, each firearm that you purchase, once you purchase, I believe it's more than three or four, your cat, your your record changes because you're now considered a collector and not just an individual with a couple of firearms. So there's there's a maintenance, um, there's 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 a lookup. After that first purchase, there is a, I believe it's 10 or 15 day waiting period. Um, I'm close enough that I'm near the District of Columbia in Virginia. Virginia, Ben, has a very different protocol. And so it, 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 it's a matter of um, what's concealed, what can you carry is concealed. In Maryland, an individual can't be a concealed weapon holder um, uh, unless under special circumstances. In Virginia, you can. And in the District of Columbia, how you carry that firearm and how you carry your ammunition varies. Um, so I, you know, th that's part of the regulatory process that I think we should be talking about. Uh, um, yes. I, I don't necessarily agree, and I'm not an NRA member by any stretch of the imagination, have no interest in being one, but I do think the conversation, we do need to talk about what does regulation look like? And yes, there are, there are hunters who need their firearms that, um, for hunting, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking yeah. about deadly force. Yeah, and what I understand is that gun owners as a whole are like, totally in agreement with the number of these things like the background checks and all that and the, you know uh red flag laws things like i, I saw a, a presentation today it's like just a survey of gun owners were like 86 percent were in, were in favor of various types of controls being in place on, on or regulations being put in place with regards to having access to guns so um i i want to ask another question which is that you know, there's some who 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 benefits from all these guns in being in America, right? Obviously, the gun makers. Okay, the gun makers as an industry must be making a lot of money. You got the gun dealers who got their little stores or their their guns owners, those gun uh uh 
those gun parties or what do they call those guns con, con, gun sales uh you know almost like the gun garage sale kind of things you know those all these folks make money off of guns right and if I, and then there's another group that i could say which would be maybe the prisons make money off of guns because with guns you have crime and with crime you get people put in prison and then they're more prison you know i mean and then you know there are publicly owned companies that own prisons you know and and uh so one of the things that i thought about is this you know all of these folks have an interest in keeping lots of guns going and in working on the political system to make it look like the nra but it's really themselves kind of keeping this gun thing going you know it kind of reminds me of the opioid uh a situation where you have you know now walgreens is is paying some of enormous amounts of various states and you have this the 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 folks who had what is that pharmaceutical company i for uh the the sackler family is trying to negotiate a settlement with regard and you know there are these various uh you know drug stores that you know and i'm looking at all these people paying money and it was like nobody you know no, nobody was looking at the opioid horrendous for i mean 20 30 years i think it's been going on this opioid at least 10 of this incredible opioid crisis and everybody was making money off of it you know and even though places were being decimated, you know, and so I feel the same kind of things going on here. We're watching all these things happen where people are decimated, but people are making money. And one thing in the United States is, you know, they say never get between a person and their money, right? In the United States, and they will push it to to. So they 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 could just consider these kids in Uvalde, you know, a cost of doing business almost, you know, which I think is horrible. But if you're at the head of some of these companies, especially if you're publicly owned, where the only thing that you are concerned with is maximizing shareholder value, as the law requires you to do, you know, you push whatever buttons you can to make sure that you can keep making a profit. You know, there's no, no morality in any of that. Ben, that's what? interesting you mentioned that. And sorry, I'm going to, I'll just say oh, this. Um, you bring up a good point. And since 2016, the cost of a firearm has increased. In some cases, it's increased by 50%. Um, a firearm can cost anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. And the ammunition, um, at one point in 2021, as well as in 2020, there was a shortage. Um, and, but, and the cost has gone up as well. So whether it's a hollow point bullet or, or not, um, that the cost has gone up. So yes, there, there's money to be made. And surprisingly, we have um, some of them, the, the firearms that you're speaking of are not manufactured in the US. They're manufactured outside of the US. And again, the intended market was initially meant to be um, law enforcement and military. And Chuck, I'll stop. Okay, well, that's a really interesting thought. What if you took the toxic tort theory that's been applied to everything from asbestos to tobacco to dangerous products to pesticides and he said okay we're going to require manufacturers to put in an amount of money that ken feinberg <laughs> the 9 11 compensation arbitrator yeah. determines is appropriate and also the bp oil spill uh, distribution manager and arbitrator determines is appropriate and you guys are going to have to fund that so that all the victims of gun violence who will be compensated according to what our legal standard customarily does in these kinds of cases well, i think that'll uh, make a difference but I mean, it's basically an insurance scheme, okay? Um, uh, we're we're self-funded by the gun makers and maybe the dealers and all that stuff uh, for the uh, uh, the I guess downstream risks of what the business that they're doing. So 
a couple thoughts that come to mind. Uh, one is, I understand that when they were trying to get the idea of uh, teachers having guns in school, the school's insurance companies told them they're going to lose their insurance. So the insurance companies, at, you know, in doing their actuarial analysis of what's going on, were like, that's not a risk we're willing to cover as part of the insurance schemes that we have. So what, you, what I think you're asking for is basically self-funding uh, insurance, basically by the manufacturer, okay? And um, that's it. it uh, that's that 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 could happen, but I have a very cynical view. Not cynical. I have a view of. You remember those pension funds that all those companies were supposed to have for all those workers, and then they went bankrupt, and lo and behold, it's found out that the pension fund wasn't really there, and these people got five cents on the dollar. And you remember that. You know, that's what I worry about the self-funding thing is that you, you'll get a CEO who, when it comes to the crunch, is going to go this way as opposed to that way with the money. And, and we find out that the actual pool is empty. Another way might be to have, a, I don't know if they do this, is to have a firearms tax, right? That a specific two firearms, there may be those already. And that would be to create a fund that would be something like a social security, if I can say it like that vision, uh, in a, pool, a, a pile of money at the federal level, sort of like the super fund kind of things. There's things like that, uh, where um, that, that, that basically would finance the downside risks of, uh, of, of, of these firearms. Um, but I, I do want to say that in a way, concern that I just have is that you're basically putting in a system that tolerates a certain amount of death by these acts that happen uh, and by having a compensation scheme there. And so that's where I, I, I kind of have a I mean, it's great to pay people off, give a million dollars to the parents of one of these kids in Uvalde. Yeah, okay, fine. But the kid is gone, you know, and, and somebody's loved one is gone. And I'm not talking about self-defense situations, right? I'm just talking about even though even in self-defense situations, the killer's family, there's a loss there too, you know, that uh, what happened. I know people don't think of it that way, but uh, somebody was a brother, a sister, or somebody. There's the loss is there. There's a loss on the victim side too, and I'm not minimizing that. I'm just trying to say that there's this death that's going on, you know. And I'm just in my that that's the thing that worries me about sort of you know self funding or a government pool to pay for the death we allow to happen, you know, in our society. I just so that's my hesitation, but. I defer to Tina. Oh my goodness, don't defer to me. Your your argument was well stated. I, I'm not certain I agree that we're funding, um, that we're actually um, encouraging death, but I, I do like the idea, Chuck, of having some type of funding, either whether it's for education or something. Um, I just, I, I don't know what it is. As you were talking, Chuck, I, I think that, and the reason I mentioned the 2016 timeframe is because there's been an uptick in the number of, of, of these acts, but underlying all of this is the, what's motivating this. And that, I think that's the bigger issue that we have to talk about. And maybe that's where the funding, if, the, if this fund was set up is to address. What, what is it that's making the person say, you know what, I'm so angry. I'm going to go and get whatever, and I'm going to go to the school or to the supermarket. Well, the supermarket incident was racially motivated, so we know yeah. that has a lot to do with it. But what is it that is giving people license that they, they, they that this is the avenue that they need to pursue? In the past, we saw this, but it wasn't commonplace. The, what I'm concerned about is that it's becoming so commonplace that people are suddenly going to be numbed by it and just say, oh, another incident and, and not 
take action, not feel outraged, not feel the sense of saying, we've got to talk about regulation. We've got to talk about the underlying factors here. Yeah. <clears throat> and that <clears throat> leads to a balancing. Yeah, Ben, as you pointed out, on one side, you've got a risk that the funds may not come together, they may not be sufficient. But on the other hand, we look at the size of this industry and its resources, and you look at the examples from other toxic tort situations, asbestos, tobacco, and others, even in the opioid situations, if the impact is sufficiently major and substantial, and the risk financially is, that industry that controls that dangerous product and the access to it and the utility of it for abusive purposes, destructive purposes, maybe they're in the position to work with the other elements of society and to be more receptive to regulation that's going to limit their financial risk and exposure. Sure. You know, what's the downside, right? If you don't put financial risks in there, we know what happens. Yeah. And I instead, mean, you've got the financial risk of the industry and the NRA having a huge portion of our elected federal and state officials use as an excuse. We can't impose gun regulation because we'll lose our elections because the lobbies and the voter blocks are too strong. When yeah. the polls show that's not the case. And, and I think there is a federal liability shield for gun manufacturers that got put in place, mm -hmm. which shows that, you know, their, their solution was, hey, we're not liable, right? You know, they're, they're laying off the risk completely to, to, to society. And, and the government was willing to go along with that, which is another comment on sort of the valuation of, of death, you know, that the government's going to shield these businesses uh, probably on the vision that it's going to keeping jobs, right? You know, the old jobs argument. But, I mean, you can, you can do a lot of evil on that job with that jobs argument, you know? I mean, slavery was a full employment thing, you know? I, I'm sorry to say it like that, but you see, it's just cynical. Yeah, and if you look at, and we're out of time for today, but you look at the 288 incidents in this recent time period in the US, and you measure those against other countries, there's one with eight, one with six, one with five, and nobody else has more than two yeah. during that time period. So how you justify that doesn't make any sense unless you start to impose the legal and financial consequences on the industry and on the users of that industry. And that's being done with the opioids. Why not with guns? Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for your provocative thoughts and ideas. We look for questions. Come back and join us in a couple of weeks and send us your questions and your thoughts, and we'll take those up too. Take care, everyone. Have a good week and a good weekend. All right. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.